Hey guys, welcome back. Haven't done uh, much content here because I've been doing other stuff, but I wanted to put an update video up here on the channel today on uh, where I'm at on the swing arm, a couple other small things, and the next project, which is already in the house, which I think you'll, uh, in the house, which I think you'll enjoy when we get to that point. All right, so here's the DME swing arm, the wide swing arm, standard length, but wide swing arm. I got it all stripped and primed. Uh, because I, as you can see, I have the uh, shock mounts welded on and I have the torque arm location welded on. Now what I did with these welds on the shock mounts, because these had to go out even further, these are much thicker than that really thin metal, which is pretty much the same thickness as the parent, you know, the main material here rather. Um, you know, I, I really welded these on with a lot of weld. I put a root weld in and then put a couple of uh, weld passes over top of that in particular on the bottom here more like a gusset and You know, I really wanted to make it look real well and you know real good and so I could have you know I could have really gone down the rabbit hole of Welding grinding welding grinding because I, I I wanted to make it look almost like it was made into this I mean the welds looked okay as far as the beads go But I just wanted to make it look better so instead of doing that, I filled the low spots in with some JB Weld, like a, essentially like if you're doing body filling, and uh, sanded it all and looks really good, blends it in. But like I said, there's a crap load of weld on both of these, and I welded in the uh, M12, I think it is, or M, I'm sorry, M10 uh, nuts on the back side. I welded these in, and of course while this was off, I just put a bolt through with a lock nut on the inside, put it in the lathe and turn that back to clean that up. There's plenty of threads on both of them to lock those in, which is really, really works well. I'm really happy with that. Now, as far as the torque arm mount goes, the torque arm is only gonna get on one side of this. Uh, usually they're in the middle of a, of a bracket, like this one on the original swing arm. But it's not possible to do in this application based upon how everything sits. Uh, so here's the torque arm. The original torque arm does work, so it's going to go on one side of it, like that. That's why this thing is so beefy. Now, what I made that out of <laughs> was the bottom of a kickstand. You know, that slotted section of a kickstand, which has got the, um, I think it's an M8 thread on the inside, and it takes the bolt for this perfectly. In fact, there's no bolt modification necessary. And so it's got the thread on the inside here. And you put this here, and it's a shank bolt. So it just, go, it just goes right through this hole, and that hole keeps everything aligned and then tightens up via the thread on the back side. I put a spacer between it, and I welded the spacer in, and then welded all around the, the sides of it to kind of fill that in. And then I did some of that JB Well filler as well. All right, but this thing is definitely on there. I needed to have something real beefy um, for that kind of torque. So. There's no question that's gonna work, all right? Okay, so the other issue I have with this setup and that I'm working on right now is I don't like these adjusters and how they, they're sloppy in here. So when you tighten the axle down and you put that you know axial load, hence the name, uh, it wants to, of course, pull everything together. So it starts on one side, pulls it through, pulls it through the wheel, which has the spacers in it, you know, to whatever's on the other side. In this case, the head goes in this way and the nuts over here. So what happens with this is, because we have this space here, it wants to crush the metal in because it's not directly contacting um, that, uh, that adjuster piece. And the stuff, that the, the, not the stuff, the, <laughs> the parts that go in here as far as the inner spacers and of course the bolt, or not as in this case, on the outside with a washer, um, they are on the outside, not on the inside here, which is appropriate. You want to lock everything together. So I didn't like that at all, because again, it just, it just, you have to, you have to essentially bend this metal by tightening it up to get it right. This is a really poor design. So to get around that, what I did was, I made some of these. It's essentially like a flange washer, and it has the appropriate depth. See if we can get it to focus on the difference between this outer edge and that inner edge. So this is aluminum, I have some steel ones, but you get the idea, it goes in here, 
It'll adjust back and forth because I have a radius cut into that to match this radius. I did that by hand. And so what happens is when this hits, it hits both that adjuster and the outside. At least it's really close. So what I've done is that was that was essentially for, for proof of concept mock-up out of aluminum. So I've made them out of steel. I have the steel one. They're not quite done yet. I don't have the radiuses milled into them yet, but the same deal. And so we're going to have one on one side, one on the other. Uh, this one is smaller at 18 mils, and this one's 20 for the full uh, diameter of the shaft, and uh, for obvious reasons. So again, we put it in here, and this is kind of rubbing on the uh, adjuster uh, more than it is on the outside of it. So I need to kind of dial this in by just fly cutting this uh, face before I finish these up 100%. But the main thing I got to do is I've got to uh, cut the um, radiuses. And I'm going to have to do that on the mill, but I don't have a rotary table yet. I ordered a rotary table so I can set this up and spin it around and mill those radiuses properly. And we'll bring those radiuses in pretty close, uh, maybe about to there. Uh, that way we get a lot of travel here because this would be the limit to your travel. And I've already tested this by putting it all together, not with that one, with this, with these, with the two aluminum ones. And you see that's the size of that, that um, space between the edge and the radius. We can make this one even a little smaller because it's out of steel. And so with this one like that, um, we can bring this up all the way and the 530 chain with uh, I think it's 110 links fits fine with a 42 on the rear and I think it's a 17 on the front which gives us the exact same or pretty close to the exact same ratio as what it was what was on the bike before I changed that 40 to a 42 so that all works okay so that's where we're at on this and I think this is going to work out great once I cut the radiuses in it all right, and that way, again, it'll, it'll go all the way up to the front and the back. So what this does, what these pieces do, is it forces that adjuster up to the inside wall of the swing arm tube. So you can see it's right up against the inside wall right there. So what happens is when you have the axial load of this thing being torqued, 60, 70, 75 foot-pounds, whatever it is, uh, without this, it's going to crush this in a little bit, and it can't ever get to that... Um, well, it probably could if you tightened up enough to get to the center aluminum adjuster part because of that play in there. But assuming I can get this dialed in, you know, by facing this down, I don't know, five or ten or eight thousandths or so with a fly cutter, that's why I left it a little proud, a little thick. Um, they'll be touching this metal at the same time it touches the aluminum adjuster and pulls everything together. There'll be one on the other side. So there's nothing that's going to crush. It's going to be a solid um, dead pull along this axial load the way it's supposed to. And, um, you know, in other words, if I didn't have anything between here and here and I put a load on this, it would want to pull the swing arm together. It would bend the swing arm in because there's nothing in the middle to support it. Well, if you miniaturize that, is the same thing would be happening to this tube, at least in the distance that uh, there is space in there between the adjuster and the inside of the square tube or rectangular tube. So that's what this is for because I just can't, I just don't want it to crush that tube and you got, you got to get these wheels tight. So again, that's what these are for. I kind of wanted to explain exactly what they do. So uh, yeah, um, I haven't figured out what we're going to do with the chain guard yet and that really is going to be a problem because I'm not going to probably weld anything to this frame for the chain guard if I do anything when I make that because I got to make one. I'll probably use those um, rivet uh, nuts drill in and use the rivet nuts, one, like at least two of them, somewhere on this frame, pro uh, swing arm rather, probably one on the top, one on the side. And that way it'll bolt up whatever I make. But the problem is on this is when this thing's in situ, the way it's supposed to be, and you know that that chain, as I've already explained, is very, very close to the, where the tire's going to be because he insists on having the widest tire possible. So in this case, it's a 160, and I'm not 100% sure the 160 is going to clear that chain. If it does, it is going to be really, really close. There's going to be no room for any type of a chain guard between the tire and the chain. I don't like that at all because it's going to sling grease up on the tire. It's a, it's a guaranteed thing. And if that's the case, then I think he's got a safety issue. So I'm going to probably end up convincing him to go to a 150. But we, we went with a 160. He's ordered the tires. 
We'll try it and see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's enough space in there. I'm not going to know until we get it in. And, uh, you know, that should be very soon. The rear brake disc is on its way up to Michigan to True Disc. I got it in the mail yesterday, the day before. So he's going to resurface that. When it comes back in, we'll paint that center portion. And for all the other guys out there that hate these shocks, these are going. He doesn't like them anymore either. These upside down looking dumbass shocks. We're not exactly sure the length yet, length yet because these are 10 mil longer than stock. There's a long reason why we did it that way, which is has to do with that aluminum swing arm in, in a much earlier video that's been long abandoned. So we're going to be changing these shocks out eventually, but I need to get this thing all together with a tire on it and get it sitting down its own weight and establish a, a ride height because we can adjust the length of the shocks by simply ordering longer or shorter shocks. And I'm just not 100% sure. These shock mounts are in the exact location that the shock mounts that came with this swing arm were located. I figured everything else being engineered for this application, or at least the KZ900-1000 application, everything else has you know, been proper as far as its alignment goes. So I assume that these are probably engineered as far as that location as well. Why change the engineering? And again, I just duplicated the same location. Um, this was interesting actually getting these off. I just cut the, um, the, the main parts of the old uh, uh, pieces off and then milled it. <laughs> I put it in the mill and just milled it flat because those things were pretty tough. Even though they were just uh, probably robotically welded, you can see right there. But, uh, you know, on some sort of a welding machine or welding robot, there wasn't very much weld on those at all. But, um, you know, I had, I weld, I milled those off rather to get them out of the way and it worked pretty well uh, so I can get these in place. So again, these are in the exact same location as the ones that were on here. I think that's going to work out pretty well. We've also got a little axle problem, sort of, um, as far as the length goes. It's always bad when it's not long enough. And in this case, that's the problem. Even with the stock axle, it is not long enough. So I have a couple of choices here. Uh, these are the ones that he brought. This is a new addition, not the band. And this is one that I thought about using, but it's hollow. He provided this in some of his parts. I really don't like these hollow axles. So um, I didn't want to, because uh, I'd have to shorten this anyway. I'd have to cut the threads longer and I just didn't want to deal with it on a hollow axle. So um, I actually uh, reached out to a place in California that was online as a customizer of like axles. And I'll try to remember the name of the place because the fellow was really nice. I emailed him a, um, a drawing of an axle very similar to this that would work. And he called me and said he's basically retiring, but he's done many of these um, modifications and he rattled off a number of OEM axles from the rear bikes, Suzuki and Kawasaki in particular, that are longer, that he's used in jobs. This wasn't one of them that he rattled off, but him saying that, I went online and started doing some searching of the ones he did mention, and this one came up. It's from a 8788ZX1000 Kawasaki, and I found one on eBay, but this ain't it. The one I, I found this one locally, actually, up in Tampa, um, I forgot the name of that place too. I'll, I'll try to put that in the uh, comments, uh, not in the comments, but in the text in the video here. And uh, they got this out to me really quick. Brand new OEM, new old stock from a ZX1000 that is plenty long. And even with those little, I'm just gonna lay it right here for you. Even with those little, um, you know, these guys on there, it's gonna be plenty long uh, for us to work with. So this unfortunately is an M16, and I'm debating whether or not to, uh, you know, keep it M16, but I'm, I'm more apt to um, uh, turn this down to 18 mil because the threads would really go back to about here. Remember, this one is cut smaller for the 18 mil threads. Actually, that one is. And so where I want the threads to actually end um, is about right there on that edge of that aluminum. So threads will be inside this metal part a little bit. And so when you put this guy on, you have some thread sticking out, it's not gonna bottom out. And I think if we just turn this down to about right there, and then it's 18 mils, and then thread this, 
Uh, I'll have to use a die because I can't single point yet. That's where we're getting to here in a minute. Uh, and there'll be plenty of room to bring a nut in and then uh, it'll be right up to the end where you typically see the nut, a castle nut. We'll drill um, you know, a hole for the uh, cotter pin and uh, it'll be good. So I think this um, axle is going to work fine. It is 20 mil diameter. I verified that and um, it's, an, it's nice looking as well. It's not all crusty, so it'll work pretty well for us. So that brings us to the second to the last thing I wanted to mention on this kind of update th uh, video. Um, I've been really struggling with the lathe situation. Um, I have outgrown this lathe for months and months now. I really need to get rid of it. So I'm this close to pulling the trigger on a much larger machine, probably somewhere around a 12 inch swing, 11 to 12 inch swing uh, with a cam lock chuck. So it'll do forward and reverse right and left hand threading metric and imperial threading single point that is and has a one and a half inch spindle bore diameter so you can put some large stock in that'll probably take up this entire area to about over here all right so i'm gonna have to rearrange some stuff um, there's a couple different options one's a 220 volt single phase and I, and I have 220 volt available right outside this wall, so it's not a big deal. In fact, it's run over to the mill right now from the same box. Or there's another one that's 110, or 120 rather. So 240 or 120, doesn't matter. I can supply the power single phase. And I'm, like I said, I'm this close to pulling a trigger on. I gotta make one phone call tomorrow to Grizzly Industrial. I'm thinking of going with a Grizzly gunsmith lathe. Um, I, I've compared that to the Precision Matthews, and it's just got more features, um, slightly more features than the PM lathe. And I, uh, John from, um, uh, what is his name, Farmcraft 101, the YouTube channel, pretty big channel. I've been in communication with him, very nice guy to answer my questions. He's got a Grizzly gunsmith lathe, and he really likes it a lot, and you see it every now and then in his channel. So I am pretty sure Assuming the wife doesn't completely put the kibosh on it, um, we're going to have a new lathe in here within the next couple months because they're, they're back order right now and it'll probably take till the end of July this month um, to get it, maybe. And then I got to figure out how to get it in here <laughs> with, with a hoist or something, like an engine hoist. And I'm going to be buying the cabinet that goes along with it that it mounts on because this isn't big enough and it's certainly not strong enough for like a 700 pound lathe. So we're going to be getting rid of all this. At some point, I'll get it on Marketplace and Craigslist and she's going to have to go because like I said, I have really outgrown this lathe and I have for quite a few months now. It, it, I just need something that I can do a lot more work on in particular, larger stock, longer stock, and um, uh, single point metric primarily and imperial threading capabilities. So the last thing is the next project. Next project is right here. Okay, thanks for watching. Just kidding. This is gonna be a fun project and you probably get an idea what it is just by looking at the front wheel there with the chrome front fender and other things like that, that kind of sort of give it away and the spokes and so forth, spokes. Spokes, folks, I'll go ahead and give you a sneak peek anyway. So there's that, there's that, and there's that. All right, that's all you get to see right now. But that's the next project that we're gonna be getting going on here as soon as we can get this back into either A, completed, or B, rolling chassis, get it out of the way. And once we get a wheel on it, you know, with the tire and blah, 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 you already know the story on that, we can do that and then get this one up on the lift and start working on it. I'm not gonna go into it in any great detail right now. You're just gonna have to watch the future videos for that. Yeah, so that's it, really quick update. Um, I, like I said, I was gonna put more stuff up earlier, but uh, what I was working on also was a, a rack of KZ650 carbs for a viewer that lives nearby. It was having trouble getting the fuel levels um, adjusted on them. I actually had trouble myself till I figured out what was going on. Didn't film any of that, uh, but uh, well, I started to, but uh, then it, it came out like crap, so I decided not to. But anyway, um, so this is going to be uh, my future video as well when we can get this done, get the re lathe replaced. It's going to be sad seeing the old girl go. 
because we've done a lot of stuff on this lathe, a lot of stuff that it was never intended on doing, you know, with, with a small machine like this and been able to get some decent accuracy out of it considering it's got flat ways, not even V ways or anything like that. Um, so she's been a good uh, trusty companion for the workshop area. And I've done, like I said, I've done a lot of stuff on it. And But it, we just need to, we have outgrown this, as I said before. We have outgrown this for many months now, so it's definitely time to upgrade. It's it's time for it to go, but I don't want you to go. You know what you need to do. You subscribe, ring the bell, like the video, share, stick around so you can see that, so you can see that, and you can see that um, at the end when it's done. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on those next videos. Uh, yeah, should be fun.